Well, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> thanks for braving the rain to join us today for today's event. Um, hopefully you're here for the neuroscience of self-control. It's a, a roundtable uh, discussion we're going to have with, uh, with, with three guests. Um, Molly Crockett from Yale University, Todd Hare from the University of Zurich, and Dylan Wagner from OSU. Uh, before we begin, we're going to have a, a brief introduction from Dean Morton O'Kelly from the Social Behavioral Sciences here at OSU. Thank you, Ian. Good, er good evening, everybody. I'm Morton O'Kelly, Dean of Social and Behavioral Sciences in the College of Arts and Sciences. So today, I think behavior is likely to be to the fore. Uh, we're very proud to be the home to the Department of Psychology, a cluster of excellence within the college, and uh, to really the intriguing areas that are clustered around the topic of neuroscience, which, as you know, has a, a home within psychology. Uh, we're very proud of the efforts in this area and especially proud of the ability of that program to host education for our undergraduate students. The neuroscience major is a remarkable achievement. Um, a few weeks ago, I attended one of the Science Sunday events. Was anybody at the Science Sunday event with Mike Neblo? And I was intrigued by that photograph up there, the young girl looking longingly at a bowl of ice cream. And I said, boy, that, that looks like a great topic. And so I'm glad to be here today to find out more about that, and I think the, uh, the intriguing concepts that are hinted at as a non-specialist to me in the abstracts and the titles of the presenters that we have presenting tonight. So I was intrigued by that, I look forward to learning more, and maybe learning a little bit about why I might have eaten too many candies on Halloween. So the ability to control is, is clearly something very, very important. I'm happy to be here to kick off this event. Uh, I think Dylan gets the prize for the shortest journey, so he came from OSU Psych Department, but also to welcome Molly and Dylan and uh, Todd to the, to the event and to uh, look forward to what they have to say. Thanks to our organizer, Ian Krybeck, and also to our moderator, Brad Mitchell. And I know there's a plan for, for a great program, so without further ado, let me turn it back over to Ian, who will be the MC for our event. Thank you very much. Okay, before we begin, I just want to quickly uh, give a few thanks. So I want to first thank our sponsors. So uh, th this event could not have uh, been put on without funding from National Science Foundation. Uh, WOSU is helping uh, film the event, so you're on, you're on tape. Uh, and also thanks to the Decision Sciences Collaborative and the Department of Psychology for also helping uh, fund this event. Um, we also advertise this event through, through several uh, outlets, including COSI After Dark, uh, Steam Factory, Science Sundays. Okay, so why are we here today? We're here to talk about self-control, and self-control is uh, a pervasive problem in, in today's society. I'm just going to give a couple brief examples before turning it over to our, to our experts, but uh, you can see on this slide uh, that you know the obesity rates are, are at an alarmingly high level and continue to rise, and have been, have been rising over the last uh, 10 years, if not longer. Uh, so obviously, you know, our ability to, to regulate cra uh, food cravings is a, is a major concern. Uh, tobacco use is another big concern. Uh, tobacco use continues to be at a high level, and uh, you can see in the Midwest, it's particularly, uh, particularly high, so it's a particular um, issue for, for us here. And finally, there's another form of, of, of self-control failure, which, you might not, which might not immediately jump to mind, which is, which is crime. So I just saw this headline today. So I'm comfortable telling you this now that it's after Halloween. But apparently, crime, uh, crime rates go up on Halloween. Uh, and you, the issue there is that you're, you know, in some case, at least in, with some crimes, you're unable to regulate your, self in, your selfish self-interest um, at the expense of someone else, right? So it's another form of self-control failure that um, Molly will be focusing on. So we're here today to try to understand what, how can neuroscience uh, help inform us about how we exert self-control and why, in some cases, we fail at exerting self-control. So we have, again, we have th three speakers. Each one is going to give us a short 10-minute 
talk, sort of overview of, of the research that's going on in their labs, and then we'll have a discussion up here on the stage and then take questions from you in the audience. Our first speaker is Molly Crockett. Molly Crockett is an assistant professor at Yale University. She did her undergraduate, at, uh, undergraduate degree at UCLA, her PhD in Cambridge, and then did postdocs at University of Zurich in Switzerland and University College London. And she is an expert. She, she started out doing uh, work in serotonin, uh, which is a neurotransmitter, uh, in various social behavior, and now her focus is on morality and social, social moral decision making. So please help me welcome uh, Molly Crockett. Thanks so much for organizing this, Ian, and uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm going to be talking about self-control in the context of controlling our self-interest at the expense of others. So I'm going to start with a story about human morality. This is a cab driver called Raymond McCausland. He goes by Buzzy, and he drives a cab around Boston. One day, Buzzy was dropping off a fare, and he noticed that his passenger had left a duffel bag in the back seat. Uh, he couldn't contact the passenger uh, because they left and didn't leave any contact info. Um, he opened the duffel bag and discovered $187,000 in cash. So Buzzy faced a self-control problem. Should he take the money for himself or should he return it to the police station, try to find the owner? His girlfriend thought he should keep the money, but he ultimately uh, decided to return the money to the police. It was reunited with its original owner who, as it turned out, had gotten the money as an inheritance from his parents and um, I don't know why he left it in the back seat. In fact, reading this story, I had many questions. <laughs> How on earth do you leave $187,000 in cash in the back seat of a cab? That's maybe a different kind of self-control problem. Um, the question that I'm going to focus on for the next few minutes is how can we explain Buzzy's moral decision to return the money? And lest you think that this is an unusual occurrence and that most people would take the money, uh, in fact, if you Google driver returns lost cash, there are actually many, many examples from all around the world uh, with very large sums of money uh, where cab drivers have returned lost cash to their owners. And this is maybe not that difficult to imagine. Maybe you could imagine yourself in this kind of situation, and I, I would hope that at least some of you uh, would also do the right thing in this case. Um, but of course, these are instances of, of moral decisions when no one's necessarily watching. And this is the, the real mystery to try and understand. It's very easy to explain why we do the right thing when we're being observed, because our reputation is very important to us, of course. And so selfishly, we don't want to get punished. We don't want to get a reputation as somebody who's very selfish. So we do the right thing when we have an audience. Um, but why do we do the right thing when we don't have an audience, when we're in private? And this is a question that we've been studying extensively in my lab. So how do we study this kind of self-control problem in the lab? We ask people to make moral decisions in private where, just like Buzzy, they have to trade off their own self-interest against the interest of somebody else. And we specifically give them the opportunity to make some cash by delivering painful electric shocks to another participant in the study. Now, the shocks don't do any lasting physical damage. They're uh, ethically permissible for us to use in experiments. They feel a little bit like running your hand under very hot water for half a second. Um, they are unpleasant enough, though, that people will give up their own money to avoid getting shocked themselves. 
So essentially what we do in these experiments is we uh, give people the opportunity to uh, earn money by delivering these shocks either to themselves or to a stranger uh, who they've never met. Uh, they don't know this person, they're not going to see them face to face. Um, so the way that this works is we have two participants come into the lab, um, they don't interact face to face, and a random drawing assigns them to the roles of decider and receiver. And then the decider uh, goes through a decision-making task, it looks like this, and they make a series of decisions uh, where they have to choose between a, a smaller number of shocks uh, for a smaller amount of money, or more money, but that comes with more shocks. So in this example, uh, getting seven shocks for $10, or getting uh, 10 shocks for $15. Now, the money is always for the person making the decisions. Um, half the time, the shocks are also for the person making the decisions. But the other half the time, the shocks are for the receiver, who's a stranger that the decider has never met. So we compare how much money people require to shock themselves versus a stranger. And by asking them many decisions like this, um, we can work out what is the price of pain for yourself and for someone else. So we're looking at the exchange rate between money and pain. We observe a wide range of preferences in this situation. Um, the nicest participants in our study uh, refused to deliver a single shock to a stranger, even for a profit of about $30 per shock. At the other end of the spectrum, we have people who are willing to deliver 20 painful shocks to another person for a profit of 10 cents. <laughs> so you can decide who you'd like to be friends with there. Another interesting question is how much money people require to shock themselves versus someone else. So what do these exchange rates look like when we compare the price of pain for self versus others? What we find, encouragingly, is that the ill-gotten gains are less valuable. So people require more compensation to shock a stranger than they require to give the same number of shocks to themselves. They're exhibiting self-control in this situation by preferring not to profit off the pain of a stranger. So how can we explain this behavior? Can looking to the brain tell us anything about what's going on. One of the brain networks that we focus on is the reward network, which you can see here, activation in the dorsal striatum and the prefrontal cortex. And what we find is that activity in this reward valuation network uh, responds very strongly to money that you get from shocking yourself but it responds less strongly to money that you get from shocking someone else. So ill-gotten gains are less valuable in the brain's reward network as well. And we can even predict individual differences in this behavior by looking at how sensitive the brain's reward network is to these ill-gotten gains. Now, this moral devaluation that we see in the brain's reward network, it turns out can be predicted uh, by an algorithm that we train on a separate group of people's moral judgments. So we collected uh, behavioral data from another group of individuals and we built a model to predict exactly how it is they make blame judgments, how they would blame someone who took the money uh, from shocking somebody else. And this model can then predict brain activity in the prefrontal cortex here, in our subjects who are making decisions in the scanner. So what this means is that as you're making private moral decisions, this brain area is showing an activity pattern that tracks with the judgments of a separate group of people. And finally, this area modulates activity in the brain's valuation network. Um, in a way that suggests it could contribute to this devaluation we see. So these results help us to understand how it is we control our selfish impulses even when nobody is watching. As I mentioned, it's very easy to explain moral behavior in public because reputation is a very powerful incentive and being generous in public pays off for ourselves in the future. 
Um, our work suggests that this concern for reputation might also apply to the moral decisions we make in private. Our conscience might be conceived of as a simulation of the moral judgments that others make. And controlling our selfish impulses seems to involve imagining what others might think if they were to catch us doing the wrong thing. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Molly. Now, we're going to transition now to a, a slightly different type of self-control. Uh, so this, I'm going to play for you uh, a, sort of a funny video uh, that involves what we call the marshmallow test. So in the marshmallow test, the participant is given a marshmallow and is told that if they wait until the experimenter comes back, they'll get two marshmallows. So they have to decide, one marshmallow now or two later. <laughs> so it turns out that this simple marshmallow test is uh, a, a strong predictor of success later in life in terms of uh, income and, 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 and things like this. And moreover, there's a lot of you know there's a lot of variability in terms of how uh, individuals in this situation deal with this deal with this uh, this marshmallow in front of them. So some close their eyes, some stare at it really up close. And so uh, we can ask like what allows people different people to deal with this kind of self-control problem in different ways. And so, to, so our next two speakers are going to talk about uh, dietary, this kind of food dietary self-control. Our, our first speaker is, uh, is Todd Hare from the University of Zurich. Uh, Todd did his, his bachelor's at Iowa State, his PhD at Cornell, and then a postdoc at Caltech in Pasadena. And he's now a professor at the University of Zurich. He's, well, he's famous for mapping out the reward network that uh, Molly was just describing and for his subsequent work on self-control in food decision making. So please welcome Todd. All right. So I'm going to give you one example of the work that we've done looking at ways that might impair self-control. So I think we all have anecdotal evidence from our own lives where we were feeling a bit stressed out and maybe made decisions or acted in ways that we wouldn't have done if we weren't so stressed. So how might stress impair our self-control? As Ian said, we're gonna focus on, how does this work? Yeah, on food choices today, but there are a lot of other domains that are important for self-control as well doing your homework instead of watching TV after school, exercising rather than maybe watching TV after school. <laughs> we talked about cigarette smoking and also saving money for the future. So there are lots of different domains in which we need to engage control to, com to do what we think we should do rather than what we might want to do in the moment right now. So what we do, rather than the marshmallow task that was described before, is you don't have to wait for anything, but we give you an option between something that is more healthy, here shown with the apple, and something that is less healthy, but might have more sugar and fat and things that we'd like the taste of. So you have an immediate trade-off between taking a healthy food or an unhealthy food. But before you make these decisions, we put some of our participants through a stress induction paradigm. What they have to do is they have to put their hand in ice cold water for an unknown period of time. It's going to be three minutes, but we don't tell them that because the fact that you don't know how long you have to hold it in there makes it more of a stressful experience. To add a social aspect to the stressor, we have an experimenter who's standing there with a clipboard and giving neutral feedback the whole time. So not angry, but also definitely not smiling. 
You're also being videotaped the entire time, and you're told that this is a performance task. The experimenter and later people who are looking at the video are going to judge how well you hold your hand in ice cold water. <laughs> you can take your hand out, but if you do, you're asked to put it back in as soon as you think you could take it again. So this is the way we induce stress into our participants. If we look at the ratings they make over here, so afterwards, the people in red were the group that went through this stress procedure, and then we have another group of controls in blue who don't go through the stress procedure. We ask them, describe how stressed you're feeling now on a scale from zero to 100, and they tell us that they're at about 35, so one third of the way to maximum stress. Whereas the other participants are significantly lower. We also measure from their saliva a hormone that's called cortisol. Many of you have probably heard of this. It's one of the hormones that it increases when the body is responding to stress. And we can see that from the baseline, before the stress induction, over the course of the next half an hour, when we're actually going to measure the food choices, there's greater cortisol in the, in the stress participants compared to the control group. Now, one thing I want to mention is that this stress, as I said before, they rated it like 35 out of 100 on average. So this isn't a massive stressor. And it actually falls in line with ratings people give during experience sampling studies where you'll get a page and they'll ask you how stressed are you feeling right now and what's going on in your life. People report this level of stress when they've been disagreeing with colleagues at work or when they're just feeling a lot of time pressure to do all the different tasks they have to finish that day. So this is a moderate amount of stress that you might experience fairly often. So what happens when we then ask them to make food choices? What we see here on the vertical axis is the percentage of the time that they fail to use self-control. And this is defined as choosing the food that they rated as being healthier than the other one. And it's a self-control challenge because we always show them, in these cases, a healthier food that is less tasty than the alternative. If we look at the difference in the level of taste that they rate for the two foods, going from the lowest difference to the highest difference, we see that the control group has a little bit more trouble at this high level, but they're pretty flat. They're not too sensitive to this difference in the taste. Whereas the stress group in red is definitely increasing the failure rate at these high levels of taste difference. So when you really have to sacrifice and give up something that you really like the taste of for something else, stress makes you less able to do that. Now we know, and Molly already talked about this a little bit, that the way that we are able to engage self-control in our brains involves the coordination of activity across different regions of the brain. So here, this graphic just shows different regions in these red circles and the connections between them in these blue lines. What we find, actually, is that there are two connections in the brain that are changing with the two different ways that we're measuring stress in our participants. Remember, we asked them to rate how much stress they felt, and we also measured the cortisol levels from their saliva. What I'm showing you here is this connection between a region of the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, which is a region Molly already talked about, and a region here in the ventral medial prefrontal cortex that we think is very important, as well as the striatum that we heard about before, in forming a valuation for the items that we're going to choose between. So this green connection here represents this syncing up of these two brain regions. And what we see is that there's a significant correlation between the stress ratings and this functional connectivity, but not between the cortisol levels, which is over here, and that region. So it's specifically rate related to how much you tell me you feel stressed, but not one of these biological markers of your stress. But we see the opposite for another connection, 
now coming from a region here in the striatum to the ventromedial prefrontal cortex. We see that that's not related to your ratings of stress, but it is related to the cortisol levels we measure in your saliva. So there seems to be two different pathways that can be affected by stress, differentially from your psychological perception of stress and your body's reactivity to the stressor. So we see here that biological stress seems to put a little bit more weight on the tastiness of the foods, kind of make that more salient for you. We saw that in the behavior as well. Whereas the psychological reactivity to stress seems to disrupt the way that we balance between health concerns and palatability or taste concerns. So I just want to quickly acknowledge that although I'm up here talking to you, the real work in this project was done by Sylvia Meyer and Aidan Makwana, and I also want to quickly acknowledge some of the funders for this. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Todd. Uh, our final speaker is Professor Dylan Wagner, Dylan Wagner from here at Ohio State. Uh, Dylan is Canadian. He did his bachelor's degree at McGill, uh, then his, did his PhD and a postdoc at Dartmouth, and he's been here at OSU for about four years now. Uh, Dylan is an expert on craving, so he's been investigated how the brain uh, craves both food and cigarettes, and so he's gonna tell us about that. So please help me welcome Dylan Wagner. Thanks. So this is a cheeseburger. Uh, these are fries. That's a perfectly acceptable donut. Uh, an assortment of beverages. This is uh, mediocre ice cream. This is better ice cream. This is Jenny's ice cream. <laughs> Uh, over here we have cigarettes, we have uh, e-juice for e-cigarettes, and we have everyone's favorite jewel, and then bacon. Um, and uh, aside from being a list of the things I had for breakfast today, uh, <laughs> what I want you to uh, think about when we talk about these is that these things didn't exist in our evolutionary prehistory, right? We have no familiarity with things like bacon or things like uh, hamburgers, uh, McDonald's, uh, was not uh, around when we were uh, evolving the kinds of cognitive modules that we have in our brains that uh, we use today. So uh, here's another one, just to distract you while I talk. Uh, I stole this from my daughter's stash. Uh, I'll, I'll put it back. I'm not going to put it back. <laughs> um, so uh, in our brains, we have a system of uh, regions that uh, respond to value, to reward, to things we, we like. These are the systems, uh, we've all spoken about them. I'm going to focus a little bit on the OFC but uh, this is very much uh, in keeping with uh, the other regions that uh, we've spoken about today. And so these are systems that tell us, you know, if we're, if we're in uh, ancient times, they tell us, you know, go get some berries, you know, go get some nuts, and, um, you know, had bison, I guess, was the thing. Um, now, we have another system of brain regions that are more implicated in, in, in self-control and actually trying to damp down those responses and, and you know, keeping a... a us focused on our goals. And so, you know, these might be the regions that tell, you know, uh, if anyone is old enough to remember Fred Flintstone, hey, Fred, like that your, you know, your, your eye is bigger than your stomach, uh, you shouldn't take that uh, piece of brontosaurus steak. Okay. Um, now, uh, what we can do these days uh, is we can use, you know, contemporary brain imaging methods to try and probe these systems and understand how they, how they talk to the, each other and how they're related to things like self-regulation success, but also how they might predict self-regulation uh, failure. Now, one of the things my lab has been uh, kind of interested in doing lately is uh, these two regions talk to each other. Um, uh, they, have a, they have a structural connection. So this is kind of just a schematic to show you that, the, you know, in addition to the gray matter regions of the brain, there's all these white matter pathways that interconnect different regions, right, and they allow for crosstalk between regions. Uh, and what we're going to do here is we're just going to figure out what the pathway is between a region involved in self-control, right, that blue region there, and then the OFC, that green region there. What the colors are showing you is just the strength of that white matter connection between both of them. Uh, in my lab, uh, we decided to just figure out the method by testing me first. So this is actually my pathway, and uh, it, it's okay. Uh, uh, it could be better, uh, it could be worse. 
Uh, but it's okay. Um, so, as I was saying, um, we don't have exposure to these kinds of food rewards, right? We don't have exposure to these advertisements, these food cues. You know, for the largest amount of time, we lived in kind of Dust Bowl era, you know, kind of poverty. But in more recent years, in the last, you know, 50, 60 years, there's been this, ex this is delicious, by the way. Um, I feel mean eating this while you guys can't. In fact, if you all look below your seats right now, just kidding. <laughs> We're scientists, we don't have that kind of money. Um, okay, so, uh, uh, um, you know, we have this explosion of advertisements and, and tasty images, tasty food cues that are sort of impinging on our attention, making us look, making us desire these things. And so what I want to talk about today is some research in my lab where we sort of look at whether our reactivity, just our, our, our you know, how responsive we are to things like uh, uh, food advertisements and cigarettes, whether that predicts self-control. And then a second kind of question is, are there biomarkers that might predict self-control uh, success, like that, that white matter pathway I just spoke about? So we use brain imaging. We, um, if you're wondering how we do this, you've already participated in the study. We basically just show people pictures of things that they tend to desire, you know, uh, cheeseburgers, uh, uh, you know, uh, after dinner cocktails, cigarettes. Uh, uh, we don't do drugs so much, but that's another thing we could do. And one of the reasons we do this is there's a lot of research, not necessarily brain imaging research, but older research that suggests that when you see a, a cue like this, something that you, you, you is tempting to you that you desire, there's a set of psychological and physiological reactions that you have uh, to stimulate like this that tend to predict reward, right? These are things we like, they're delicious, they, they are rewarding to us, in some cases they're drugs and they actually hijack our brain's reward system. And so, you know, we have this set of responses, things like uh, our heart rate goes up, our galvanic skin response goes up, we tend to consume the things we like, that's not surprising, we tend to crave the things we like, and then of course we also see brain activity, and in particular from my talk, I don't know why I keep using this, because I'm not actually getting it to work, uh, but anyhow, I'm going to be talking about the uh, OFC uh, specifically. Now, let me walk you through some examples of that kind of research to show you how, how it works. Uh, in one of the earliest studies we did in this domain, we uh, did what is probably the most fun uh, fMRI study that I, I think participants have ever been in. We had them come in and watch a movie. Um, in particular, we sort of surreptitiously recruited smokers and non-smokers. The smokers didn't know that they were recruited to be in the study because they were smokers. We just happened to know. Um, and what we did is we showed them a movie with the great uh, American actor, Nicolas Cage. Uh, uh, this was because, you know, everyone loves Nicolas Cage, so it would be enjoyable for them. Uh, the movie we showed them was called Matchstick Men. As you might tell by the title, there's a lot of smoking in Matchstick Men. And one of the things we did is we just sort of showed them 30 minutes of this movie, and we're able to break down the scenes in the movie uh, between those that had smoking scenes, a set of match scenes that were matched for sort of duration and frequency but didn't have any smoking in them, and this, then just other parts of the movie. And I'm just showing you this here quickly to show you that, as you might expect, smokers who've come to associate, you know, smoking with the reward of having a cigarette, they show more activity than non-smokers in the orbital frontal region when they're seeing smoking scenes. And they do this even though they have no idea this is what the study is about. You know, they don't know that we recruited them because they're smokers. We don't know that, they don't know that smoking is important to us. And so this sort of just happens spontaneously. <clears throat> now, the next study I kind of want to talk about that we've run uh, has more to do with kind of the interaction between these brain systems and actual sort of real worldish cues, right? These kinds of, uh, you know, images of food that I've shown you, they're not necessarily what we tend to see out in the world in our day-to-day -day life. Uh, so for this study, we kind of switched it up a little bit. We actually uh, mixed... Um, uh, smoking with food, so as you might be aware of uh, in the e-cigarette world, uh, there's been an explosion of sort of e-cigarette flavors that use food to kind of entice you to, uh, to try them, right? Here's, here's cookie e-cigarette juice that you can smoke, it tastes like cookies. Here's uh, 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 honey glazed donut e-cigarette juice that you can smoke and it tastes like honey glazed donuts. And so one of the crazy things that, that e-cigarette advertisers are doing, right, is they're using these food cues to kind of get your attention. You already like the thing going into it, and once they got your attention, well, you're halfway there to kind of trying it. And so what we did in this study is we did an eye tracking study, and all that means is as people saw this, these images, we, we looked at where their eyes were looking. And in particular, what we did is we took scenes from around Columbus. You might even recognize a store. It could be in your neighborhood. I'm not exactly sure where it is. Uh, but we took, a, we took a ton of pictures of storefronts around Columbus, and we surreptitiously kind of photoshopped in uh, either a flavored e-cigarette ad or an unflavored e-cigarette ad. And we did little things like we added reflection to the window, we curled up the paper to make it believable so that people didn't realize that we just kind of manipulated the image. And then we measured their eye tracking as they were looking at this. 
Here's an example of that, no maybe big surprise, but these, these, the pairing of, of e-cigarettes with food tends to attract people's attention. They look more at those kinds of scenes than they do at just the regular sort of e-cigarette kind of scene. Now, what we also did is we brought people in and we scanned them while they were looking at appetizing images of food, as I've shown you, and also uh, these kinds of uh, flavored e-cigarette images. And what we wanted to do was look at the relationship between reward sensitivity, how their brain uh, uh, their OFC responds to these reward images, right? These images of um, foods and of flavored e-cigarettes, as well as, uh, an, and in fact, examine how that predicts the eye tracking data that we measured separately. And what I didn't tell you is we actually did the scanning study first and the eye tracking study second. And so what we can do is we can ask, you know, does your reward sensitivity, does the amount of a reward act related activity you show to these kinds of stimuli predict your attentional bias towards these images? Do you tend to look more at those ads, even when you have no idea that that's what we're studying, if you're someone who already is kind of highly uh, uh, cued into, into liking them, right? Who is kind of highly sensitive to that. And that's basically what we find. The more that people were sensitive to these kinds of food cues, the more they went to look at them in the environment, even in the absence of any sort of instruction to do so. Um, so the last study I want to tell you about is uh, uh, this one here, where we're trying to now look at the interplay between uh, these regions. So this is a study looking at how that self-control region that I spoke about, and how this reward region that I spoke about, how they talk to each other and whether that predicts anything. So as I've already told you, we map that out in me, right? That's my pathway. That's a structural pathway linking these two regions. It's more bigger in some people. It's uh, smaller, less good in other people. Uh, you can think of it as sort of like the internet. In some cases, you have better uh, bandwidth and other people might have lower bandwidth. They might still be on dial-up. Um, and so uh, what we can do then is take the individual differences in that measure and see if it predicts anything. Does it predict things like body weight, right? And so that's exactly what uh, we did in this case. So we find that the, uh, the structural integrity of this pathway, how good that pathway is between these two regions, actually goes on to predict percentage body fat uh, in a sample. And we've actually, I'm not gonna show you, but we actually also replicated uh, this in a very large, like 200, 300 people sample of um, uh, community samples across the lifespan. So it turns out this pathway actually predicts BMI uh, uh, in very large uh, uh, populations of people. Okay, so putting it all together, what this kind of left us with is this admittedly very simple model of self-regulation where we kind of posit that, you know, these, these reward cues and, oops, that's, I'm skipping ahead, uh, these <laughs> reward cues uh, and these other kinds of uh, uh, um, Situations can impair our ability to engage in self-control. So in some cases, you know, if we're exposed to like tempting food advertisements, we might, we might get more activity in these regions related to reward sensitivity, and that might overwhelm our ability to engage in self-control, right? Our craving is so high that we just can't engage in self-control. You might not like Appenzeller's cheese, but I have a really big problem with Appenzeller cheese, and so for me, it's really hard to resist if someone comes out with that kind of cheese that is so pretentious, I know, but I really like it. Um, now, uh, other things might knock out our ability to engage in self-control, right? So we've talked about, you know, we talk about negative mood, but you could also see relationships with stress. Uh, things like if you drink a lot of alcohol, your ability to engage in, in self-regulation is impaired, your prefrontal cortex is impaired, and then obviously things like brain damage. So putting it together, you know, we kind of have this simplistic model that, that with the idea is, is that uh, when these things are balanced, when your ability to engage in self-control sort of balances out your, the impulses, the reward activity that you get in these regions, then you're sort of effective in your day-to-day -day life. But whenever these things are out of whack, you start getting self-regulation failure. And with that, I'll thank you. Okay, that concludes the, <clears throat> the, the talk part of our, of our program, and now we're going to have a moderated discussion uh, up on the stage between our three speakers and our moderator, Brad Mitchell. Brad Mitchell is a former, uh, former professor of education here at OSU, and now he's the, um, he's the chief strategist at Battelle for Kids. And because this is a social and behavioral thing, I want to give you warm feedback and cool feedback at the beginning. The warm feedback, and I think you should give a round of applause, we have three academics that did three presentations in 10 minutes or less. They actually <laughs> hit their mark. Let's get self-control at really a high, high level. I wasn't counting on you doing that, but you really came through. So <laughs> uh, the cool feedback is uh, the slightly uh, sadistic uh, uh, methods that you use, putting hands in cold water, <laughs> shocking people, this is a little scary to me, uh, but uh, maybe we'll talk about that in a second. And anybody that will show his brain, 
scan. <laughs> um, I think that should be part of tenure, re tenure review for moving forward so we see the brains and then a lot of things can I be decided. I pointed out that there's actually like a little spot missing. I actually have a little, well, I'm not going to talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a spot that makes me on time for things and uh, it's not there. Okay. Well, it's good to know. Uh, so we're going to take about 20 minutes of, of conversation, then we're going to open up to you guys for your questions. Um, I want to start and make this round robin beginning, but then from now on, let's just make it a conversation after the first question. And we'll just go right to my right to my left. Why do you study self-control? Go the other way around. <laughs> um, that's, a, that's a good question. Uh, uh, wow, I don't even know if I've really thought of it before. Um, I mean, you know, there, there's the dull reason, which is it was what my advisor was studying when I entered graduate school, and I found it really, really interesting. Uh, there's the me-search region reason, which is I'm not necessarily always the greatest at it. I'm not the most punctual person, people, and so there's an interest there in just like why, why do these things happen. Um, but then I think the more, you know, this isn't the best answer, but the more I got into it, the more I just found the, the research fascinating, the idea that, uh, you know, we might have, we'd have, might have models, we might have ways of predicting who will fail and who will not. Potentially, we can even give them ideas as how to do better. Um, uh, it just really sort of uh, uh, stuck. And, and so over time, I just started having more and more ideas in the area and, and kept with it. Um, yeah, I wouldn't say it was like a, a religious calling or anything. It was just something that I, I really fell in love with uh, through, through doing. Great. Why? I've always been fascinated by the fact that uh, humans are, are sort of uniquely blessed and cursed with the ability to reflect on our own stupidity and failure. And, uh, and in the case of self-control, I think this is a, a, a clear example of where we can see how to make optimal decisions and, and better decisions that are healthier, kinder, more generous, but we often don't. And then the question is why? And that's where science comes in. Yeah. All right, I have to go third when everyone said everything good already. But <laughs> um, the thing I would add to that is that I think it's, it's fundamental for us in our social environments to have some ability to not do what we're immediately driven to do, but step back and think, OK, what should I really do here? What's better for me in the long run, maybe? And so I think it's maybe the most fundamental skill that we have, therefore very interesting to study. So as a layperson, what struck me in reading some of your articles, and you could tell, you could say, Brad, you're way off on this. One of the things that struck me as I read your articles, it was somewhat related to the cartoon you showed of the McDonald's and the Neanderthal period of time, or the hunter-gathering period of time, is I fear that there are a lot of economic and political and other interests that want that gain by reducing our self-control. Whether it's gaming manufacturers or our phone devices or uh, restaurants or franchises or political campaigns, I sense, and I'd be, you study this, and I, I was thinking one of you might say, man, this may be uh, the main thing about being human and humane in the 21st century is the, uh, the war on self-control. Maybe I'm overplaying that. Calm me down. Am I being too crazy to think that there's a lot of things out there vying for our non-self-control attention to, to, to sell things or for other people's interests? Anybody want to tackle that? Absolutely. Uh, the, the tech ethicist Tristan Harris calls a phone a slot machine in your pocket. And I think that's a really apt uh, analogy. There are thousands upon thousands of expert uh, engineer hours behind every app on your phone that uh, that time has been dedicated to making the app and the experience as engaging as possible, meaning keeping you on there as long as possible and using the principles of curiosity activity and, and reward learning and self-control failure to uh, to maximize income for the company. So the incentives are not uh, in our favor. They are in the favor of the uh, companies who, who produce these free products. Um, they're, they're, they're free only in a, a very basic sense. There is a cost. And in particular, you, uh, I listened to a podcast you were on, I think, called Bad Wizards. 
Does that sound familiar? Very bad wizards. Very bad wizards. Very, very bad. Um, and in there, you talked about a study by William Brady, I think, Billy Brady, mm -hmm. about um, tweeting mm -hmm. and moral, emotional words mm -hmm. that can play to the base of either ideology, conservative or mm -hmm. liberal, uh, to either have them retweet or increase their engagement. Talk a little bit about how the political use of, of, of these things come into play. So um, moral emotions are like outrage are, uh, are, are really tailor-made to go viral on social media for many reasons. Um, they're, they are immediately gratifying to express and um, I've done some work, many others have done some brain imaging work showing that, that sort of expressing outrage, uh, m punishing somebody who's behaved unfairly engages those same uh, reward systems, striatum, orbital frontal cortex, like we've been talking about here. Uh, and of course, when you express outrage and then all of your friends and your social network like that, that gives you a, a, a reinforcement for doing that more in the future. So um, the 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 emotion is 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 a really powerful one, uh, and 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 spreads very rapidly on social media. So Billy Brady, who's a, a postdoc in my lab, before he came to my lab during his PhD, published this work showing that um, every moral sentiment in a tweet increases its retweet likelihood by 20%. So um, this, is, uh, this is what I think is driving the spread of disinformation and fake news. If you look at uh, the content that has uh, gone viral on social media uh, over the past several years, it is using words like attack, destroy, you wouldn't believe you know, what so-and-so did, it's so outrageous, like this is the content that's going viral. And explain a little more, if you give detail, you gave a couple examples. What's a moral sentiment? Operationalize that for us. What's well, an express out, moral? Outrage or, or, or a, a word that, uh, that has both moral qualities and emotional, emotional qualities. So hate, attack, destroy, these are, these are moral, emotional words. And you, in terms of, uh, am I being overly crazy that this is a, this, the human brain is uh, under siege here? Yeah. Uh, I don't think all of it is intentional or so companies exist to make money and if they're producing products they're going to produce the ones that consumers will buy so I mean Dylan showed a lot of examples of, of different foods and these e-cigarettes and if no one bought them they wouldn't sell them anymore if we only looked after the the fruits and vegetables that's all that would be in the supermarket and it's not necessarily our fault we're doing something wrong in buying these things because they are rewarding for us. We like them. But if we could maybe engage a little bit of self-regulation and shift the patterns of what we buy, then companies would sell us different things. So there's a feedback cycle there, and that's maybe the hope that we have to, to change this in our favor. That would be the hopeful spin on this. Now, the flip side to this, um, in doing some research on again and again, you can say, Brad, you, you have a limited understanding, is some of this work, not necessarily your work, but some of the work in neuroscience and self-control is getting debunked, that it is pop neuroscience or it's voodoo neuroscience. To what extent in your fields is that an issue and a dilemma? And is it more that the science is being misinterpreted by the non-scientist? Uh, but it comes into play as kind of the flip side here is that we're overplaying the neuroscience connections. Mm -hmm. uh, I think you did a TED talk about chocolate and cheese being uh, important for something. Um, where are we with, uh, with the neuroscience validity and the interpretation issues? Can I, would it be okay if I just hop on this last question Absolutely first? Absolutely not. Yeah. No, of course not. Right. It's a fascinating one. I, I, you know, there is, I don't know if, if you would agree, Todd, but there is, there is a sense that I feel like we're, we are being manipulated on some level uh, at least very algorithmically, right? In a, in a way that we haven't been, I don't think, in the past. I was reading this amazing article on how Netflix carefully designs TV shows for you. You don't even know you want them yet, but we all want it. It turns out we all wanted Stranger Things. They knew that we wanted it. They made it. It was super famous. I'm addicted. I binge watch it. So, so they know, you know, there, there is a sense that there's, a, there's this power to these newer sort of machine learning and computer science related methods to really manipulate us in ways that I don't think was as clear to do before. And one of the things I just wanted to add to this question before we, we go on is uh, there's uh, a research that I'm affiliated with. It's largely research done by a postdoc named Richard Lopez uh, at Rice 
uh, showing that um, our smartphones not only I mean not only are they sort of you know always kind of trying vying for our attention but that there might be some some really serious downsides to that which is that by training us to constantly pay attention to the external environment they might be luring our attentional system to pay more attention to the external environment reduce our ability to you know, engage in uh, uh, like like vigilance, like actually reading a full-length newspaper article. <laughs> uh, who does that anymore? Uh, uh, but in so doing, that might actually make us more. So, in a lot of the stuff I've talked about, we actually show that if you can measure people's tendency to to engage in what we call media multitasking, so actually like constantly checking your phone, unlocking it, seeing if you got emails, going to Reddit, going you know to f the news, going back to Reddit, checking Facebook. If you do that kind of a thing, the more you tend to do that, the more <laughs> curiactive you are to these kinds of Im these kinds of things and in, in, uh, these food advertisements that we show and these food images that we show. Which you know, I don't think the work has been done yet to go on to show that like that also means you're going to you know gain weight and smoke and all these other things. But it's not a big leap to to worry a little bit that we might be training children to pay too much attention to the external environment. Uh, uh, and get sucked into all the rewards that are out there, and they're getting better at getting our attention. So I don't know. I'm totally on the dystopia side of things. I think you're. <laughs> I don't think you're crazy at all. We're, we're all going down. We'll get you another chocolate. It'll we'll be fine. <laughs> well, let's ping pong to your work, Todd. In a way, you talked about psychological stress and physio and uh, biological stress. Mm -hmm. um, could this attachment to the outside and all the forces can that actually increase psychological stress? Can our engagement with our devices? actually increase psychological stress and then make it more difficult for us to self-regulate? Yeah, I think, uh, so Dylan was mentioning this, that multitasking, it, the more we feel like we have to stay on top of so many different things, streams of information, this is one of the most uh, time pressure and is one of the most stressful things for us. And especially in the domain of, of food choice, which is the one I know the most about, when we make sort of thoughtless, quick decisions, those are not likely to be healthy decisions. I and mean, we can, of course, establish for ourselves the pattern of eating healthy, and then what we do quickly and without thought becomes a healthy choice. But most of us haven't done that yet. And so if we're distracted by our devices, whether or not they stress us or not, this is probably going to be detrimental for our decision making. And if we feel like whenever we're not using our device, we're missing something, maybe causing us a bit of stress, then this is even worse, right? Which becomes a vicious cycle. So going back to the question I was going to get to, which I, but I appreciate you going deeper in that. In this milieu, um, are we overplaying, underplaying, misplaying the role neuroscience can play in helping us understand and move forward with this? Uh, I can start, I guess. So I think science is meant to be improved over time. So use the word debunking. And certainly there are findings that have turned out to be wrong. But that's the way it's supposed to work as well. So we start off down a, a line that we think looks promising, we think it's explaining something for us. But many times it will turn out that that's not the whole truth or maybe not any of the truth. But we still figure that out and then we make progress on top of that. Um, so I think the fact that we figured out some things are not right, is the way it's supposed to go. Do we understand neuroscience and self-control? Absolutely not. Will we understand it completely by the time we're all long gone? Probably not. But we're making progress. And given that our brains control everything that we do, we need to use the brain to understand self-control. I feel like I just entered the matrix. <laughs> <laughs> Molly? I'm encouraged by the convergence among uh, or between many different lines of research, particularly in the domain of self-control. So, and I'm sure that you all noticed um, amongst our presentations, which were on you know, quite different phenomena in the domain of self-control, uh, the same brain areas are popping up again and again. Um, one thing I didn't mention explicitly in my talk, but the area of prefrontal cortex that we find to be involved in self-regulation in the moral domain is actually the exact same brain area that Todd has found in his studies of self-control in um, health and food decisions. Um, and I think that's quite remarkable that you can see convergence um, in the brain between very different domains of self-control and the mechanism seems to be common to, to different, uh, different ways of, of self-regulation. 
I guess there's a part of your question I'd like to pick at, which is maybe what you're also alluding to is whether we're giving too much prominence to self-control, at least outside of academe. Um, uh, or sorry, not too much prominence to self-control, too much prominence, prominence to neuroscience in explaining self-regulation failure and self-control failure. Um, and, and there's, I don't know to tell you about that. I think, it's, I think it's intrinsically fascinating to study the brain, but there's definitely an allure to it that I think that the popular press might pick up more on than other, uh, other areas of psychology that have been studying self-control for a very long time. Uh, many of my colleagues uh, study self-control from a purely behavioral perspective and have been doing so for ages, and their research is equally as predictive and equally as, as interesting and, and in, in some cases more mechanistic than my own. Um, uh, and yet, it, you know, there, there's maybe more of, I don't know, a jazzy element to neuroscience or something that makes it get picked up more. And I don't know, I don't know what the appropriate answer to that should be. I mean, uh, I, I think, you know, science getting out of the ivory tower and into people's hearts and minds is hugely important. And so I'm okay, and if it happens to be mine, all right. <laughs> um, but, uh, uh, but, but, you know, there, sh there should be a balance. Other health psychologies also look at self-regulation, failure, addiction psychology. There's so many psychologies that have looked at this, uh, so many domains of psychology, and, and so um, there could be a sense that maybe uh, neuroscience kind of is, is uh, getting a little too much recognition, but I also think that neuroscience has a lot, a lot to give. It's maybe in some parts more directly uh, a tied, you know, as Todd said, to you know, we are we are our brains, and so it makes sense to, in some ways, focus on that at that level of analysis, um, even if there are some, you know, constraints that we have to deal with that maybe our colleagues who do pure behavioral research have a bit more freedom with. Um, I don't know. As far as I'm concerned, they should cover everything. So building off that, in terms of uh, these issues, are there connections, be growing connections between neuroscience and cognitive science, on dealing with these issues? Are, are there, is there more interdisciplinary going on between neuroscience and cognitive science? Are they in the same departments and places around the country? Often, yeah. I mean, yeah. there's a field called cognitive neuroscience. So that, um, there's definitely a marriage between these two things. And uh, so Dylan was extremely right to point out that you can study self-control from a lot of different perspectives. And even if you're fundamentally interested in the brain, you can't understand how that works unless you understand behavior and how to drive behavior and study behavior. So you need to do the two things in concert. So to get you guys prepared in about six minutes or less, we'll take questions from you, but I have just a couple more questions on this. And it goes back to stakes. One of the questions goes back to stakes. And I'm going to pick on you again. And it's an article that's seven years old, so it might have changed in seven years that you helped co-author. In the, in the article, you said that it's estimated that 40% of deaths are attributable to poor self-regulation, whether it be obesity, diabetics, uh, diabetes, or cancer, or smoking, or stuff. Do you still hold to that, and what does oh, that mean? Yeah, well, that's an easy one. I didn't do the estimation, <laughs> so I can pass that on to. Uh, hopefully, you have the article because it's whoever I cited, and I don't. I don't exactly remember, but there's certainly been these these more uh, epidemiological studies that have attempted to sort of um, uh, parse out the role of self-control. Uh, uh, in in daily life, and you know, it comes up time and time again that being good at self control, however it's measured, whether it's with a scale, whether it's with the marshmallow test, as we saw in the video, just simple measurements of behavior, whether it's with done with the brain, as we've been doing, um, uh, individual differences in the ability of people to to engage in self control, to effectively regulate their behavior, seems to just have nothing but positive life outcomes. I mean, whether it's job success, whether it's relationship success whether it's you know, uh, having lower BMI, all of those things. And so in this case, uh, you know, that, that study of 40%, I don't think, um, you know, seven years old, I might have to go back and reread the paper, but I, I don't think it's necessarily like it's all pratfalls, right? These people are so bungling that they're just like falling off ladders or whatever. Uh, but I'm sure a lot of that is, is more in the realm of like, these are also the people who are, are maybe using drugs too much or, or uh, still smoking, uh, you know, uh, uh, eating, eating uh, an unhealthy diet. Um, those kinds of things. Um, and so all of those things, you know, epidemiology sort of compound to, to uh, lead to, you know, earlier mortality. I think that gets back to my first question. On the one hand, you've got pretty good science that says appropriate self-regulation, whatever that means, is tied or correlated to improved relationships, um, increased job success, better mental health. And then what we started to talk about, though it's for a lot of companies an interest in, in getting at bad self-regulation to push kind of things. And, we humans are in the middle of these mm -hmm. two type of things, which leads me to my uh, kind of last question before we open it up. 
or maybe two questions before we open up, is um, what do we know from your various research and others about how can you increase self-regulation? What, uh, what are the things we've learned about how to increase the capacity to self-regulate? All right. Um, so actually, this is related to some of Molly's work, but some of our work as well. So clearly, if stress reduces your self-control, you should try to reduce your stress. That seems obvious. Other ways that you can help is sort of by avoiding the situations that tap your self-control the most. So many people, uh, Molly has a study using brain imaging on this, but use a technique called uh, pre-commitment, where if you can form a plan of what you're going to do, let's, let's take lunch. You're pre-committed that you're going to have a healthy lunch, salad, whatever, and not cheeseburgers and fries. You have this plan ahead of time, you go to a place where they only offer salad, then you can't be tempted by the burger and fries. So we can use our intelligence to put ourselves in situations where we're more likely to succeed and do the thing we want to do, and we don't even have to face the challenge at all. Another, um, another form of, of pre-commitment, in a sense, is, is pre-committing by uh, choosing to surround yourself with people who are a good influence. Uh, so we've, we've been doing some studies uh, looking at social influence on the kinds of moral decisions that I told you about earlier. And um, just seeing the, the choices of somebody who's a lot more altruistic than you are uh, is enough to shift your own behavior towards a more generous direction. Um, so, so, you know, that, that ours is not the first study to show that. There are many studies that, uh, that, that show you, you can um, improve your own behavior by being around other people who, who are exemplifying the, the way you want to be. And in the field of neuroscience, is this kind of social capital aspect or social learning aspect, the classic thing, if I want to run, if I have a running mate, I have a better chance of maintaining that type of stuff. Is there more and more research about the social milieu of self-regulation? Because just the phrase itself, it makes it sound like it's my responsibility. It's my oh. commitments. But uh, is there so stuff out there to say the more you can make uh, self-regulation social, uh, the better chance that you might have at regulating? Yeah, there's, there's some research on this, um, behavioral and neural. On, on the behavioral side, um, the social pre-commitment is one of the most effective types of pre-commitment. So if, if, if you put your reputation on the line, if you, if you, you know, post on social media that you're going to change your diet or you're going to go to the gym regularly, if you, if you make a plan to meet a friend to exercise, uh, then if, if you break that plan, then you're letting not only yourself down, you're letting your friend down. Like these are ways of imposing more external costs. Uh, on you, and then and then on on the on the neuroscience side, um, there's been some really interesting work, like a, a study by um, Mona Garvard and colleagues showed that if if, if you are, are are thinking about the the choices of others, um, this this actually changes the the response in in the valuation network in the brain to the choices that you make yourself. So um, there's evidence for for sort of um, plasticity in your own preferences, uh, depending on who you're surrounded with. Dylan, you want to say anything else? Um, yeah, sorry, I had something I didn't want to say. Uh, well, we've, so, actually, I didn't, again, another thing I did not do, but a colleague of mine who's, who's um, used some of the same tasks that we did uh, actually has tried to just show, you know, in a relatively simplistic matter, can we actually train people to, uh, to, to not place as much importance in these cues. Can we basically devalue those cues through training? And so uh, it turns out that's notoriously difficult to do if people have heard all the brain training games that were popular as apps and popular in, in the press don't seem to work that well. Uh, that research doesn't really bear out. So it's kind of a silly idea to even try. Uh, but he came up with a task, what's kind of called essentially like a response inhibition or go-no-go -go kind of task where you see the same kinds of food images we show and you just have to kind of you know, actively uh, uh, stop yourself from sort of saying like, yes, I want. It's a, basically a little iPhone game. And he had people play this for weeks and weeks. Uh, the game would buzz them saying, you know, now it's your time to play. And then he, they brought them to the scanner and showed that the neural response to these, these food advertisements and food cues 
went down compared to before they played the game. And they had a whole other set of people who didn't play the game. So that was sort of some evidence that you can kind of get people to devalue these cues. But I will say right off the bat that the, the size of that effect is nowhere near as big as things like, like, like Molly was talking about, like you know, social influence, pre-commitment, all these other strategies far outweigh. I mean, basically, when you're already exposed to something that you're tempted to have, it's too late. I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's in your, you know, you, it's in your attentional system. You have to engage really effortful self-control. If you can actually set yourself up to never be in that position in the first place, you'll never have to engage effortful self-control. And effortful self-control is the kind of self-control I think we struggle the most with. You know, things like, you know, not buying the chocolate so that it's not in your house, you know, at 11 p.m. when you're about to go to bed and say, hey, I could totally use a snack. Uh, uh, that's easy. It's, it's, if the snack's already there, then you're, you're in trouble. If, if someone puts it in your bedroom, you're even worse trouble. Um, my child has been putting candy. So I was gonna say, <laughs> like it's a personal experience you've gone through. So the last I had to ask is each of you, before we started, I said, what's the key question I could ask that you don't necessarily have an answer to? And it kind of relates to what I just said, but let's round robin one more time. And you guys came up to with, well, how does any person determine what they should do? You know, with all this stuff out there, all these various approaches, uh, stuff. What, it, what, how would you respond to the question of how do, how do we determine what we should do when you've got uh, implicit cognition issues that you're not even aware of um, and a variety of these other things? How do you determine what you should do? Yeah. Um, so I think it, it's key for us as researchers on two levels. One, if people want to determine what they should do, they need to know that before they can engage in self-control. But if we want to study self-control, we also have to know what they think they should do, right? So there, that's even harder in some sense because we have to figure out, is this really a self-control failure for you when you eat the burger and fries? Or did you just decide, I think eating a burger and fries is fine because I'm going to spend the next week going to the gym every morning and I'll burn it off. Um, but that's really the, the trade-off that, in some sense, if we want the optimal outcome, we have to figure out what we should do. But self-control only comes into play once we've decided, this is what I believe I should do, and then we run into obstacles or temptations that take us down another path. So if, if we're purely interested in the ability, either behaviorally from the brain, to engage in self-control, all we need to know is what the person decided. But how someone decides that and how to know because it keeps changing according to the recommendations for food, right? So 10 years ago, this dietary pyramid was different from the way it is now. So how can I stay on top of this and know what I should do? And if I always have to change and come up with different strategies, that just makes it harder. Molly? It's a great question. And uh, we, we engage a lot with philosophers in our work on, on self-regulation and the moral domain uh, because, of course, philosophers have been in the business for thousands of years of figuring out what one ought to do in, in moral dilemmas. Um, and, and you know, in many cases, they're really not straightforward. I mean, even, even in, in our lab experiments, which we design to be as straightforward as possible, and I think we would all agree that, like, uh, hurting someone else to get money is, is the wrong thing to do. But what if that money is going to be donated to a, a cause that, that saves lives, you know, as is somewhere, um, then maybe, maybe shocking somebody, which is not permanently damaging, is worth it, right? So I mean, there, there, there are lots of nuances there. Um, philosophers like to talk about a, a distinction between what, what's called uh, first order desires and second order desires. And, and first order desires are basically what we want in the moment. And second order desires are what we want to want. And uh, the idea is that to, to optimize our decision making, we really need to be optimizing those second order desires. And the way you discover what those are is to pay attention to how you feel about your choices. So do you regret what you did? Do you feel guilty about what you did? Um, those kinds of emotions can be cues towards what our second order desires are. And, um, um, strategies like pre-commitment help us enforce our second over order desires uh, in cases when our, our first order desires uh, threaten those. Dylan? That's a really tricky question. Um, I, I think I might be taking it too literally, 
but um, it's one of these cases where I think, I think neuroscience might actually have something to, con one of these cases, one of the many cases where neuroscience has something to contribute. Um, but uh, so we've been doing, starting to do work that, that I, I, I think, again, and I think I'm taking this way too literally, uh, might be able to arbitrate between what are good strategies for self-regulation. And the, the tack we're taking is completely new, completely unlike the work I've been showing, which is we're trying to understand what uh, you know, but we're looking at the, at the brain in terms of like a, patterns of brain activity for different kinds of foods, healthy foods, unhealthy foods. And we're trying to basically, first of all, just define, uh, and this is work with my graduate student who's in the audience, we're trying to define what good, sort of a good representation of those foods should be. You know, you're focusing on the healthy side, you're maybe downplaying on the taste side, and then we're going to take people who don't have such good self-regulation and try and see, A, how they deviate from that, and then what kind of strategies we can get them to do to look more like that. And the, the reason we're taking this approach, and it's kind of an engineering approach, is this way we can optimize toward, you know, if we know what it looks like, we can try different things to get you there, and we actually have a metric as to what successful, what, what we're operationalizing as successful self-regulation looks like. And so some of the things we want to try are strategies like, frankly, just asking them to pay attention to the healthy aspects versus the, the tasty aspects of the food. And then the other thing, and this is a completely weird new idea that uh, uh, we're borrowing from a researcher, Kevin Oxner, who did this in the emotional domain, we're going to ask them to pretend to be other people. And I just, I love that idea so much because it's just like, what if the easiest way to self-regulate is, you know, just pretend you're like a really good dieter who runs marathons. We know how to do that. If we tell people like, hey, why don't you like, when you're seeing the cue, like imagine it's something else and engage your self-regulation. That's, those are weird abstract instructions. That's difficult. That's traditionally what we do in psychology, but it's difficult. What if the easiest thing in the world to do is just not be yourself? If you have a hard time <laughs> with food, just you know, pretend you're a marathon runner or an Olympian and you look at the food and you're like, no, that's not for me. Um, or you know, if you're having a hard time gaining weight, which I don't know who those people are, but they exist, then, then pretend you're a glutton. And, and, and now you can actually you know, maybe view the, view the food differently and do so in an easier way. And so these are, we haven't done any of these things yet, so they're all just on I a think whiteboard. But because that's how I got through middle school, was pretending to be somebody yeah. else. So I think it worked. <laughs> so let's open it up. I think there's somebody who's got a microphone. If you have a question, raise your hand. Yes, right next to the person. Please stand up and state your question. Uh, so my question is for Dr. Crockett. As a philosopher uh, who's very interested in psychology, uh, one of the, the defects that I saw in your research, or at least I saw it as a defect, is a conflation between the moral domain and the pro-social domain. And so not to say that the pro-social shouldn't be researched, um, but I was curious. So I, I feel sort of bad being the, an ethicist who thinks it's OK to shock people for money. Um, and not just for some further goal, but namely, um, these people have agreed to participate. Uh, I might be getting more money this way than otherwise. It's not super pro-social, but all the same, they've agreed to it. So, um, but I, I'm wondering if there's research that you could do, or, or if maybe you've, you've already done regarding sort of anti-social, pro-moral behavior. And here, the best example I can think of is uh, Huck Finn rescuing Jim. So he sees this as anti-social behavior all the same, and, and he actually thinks he's going against his conscience. Um, but I'm wondering if, if you have any thoughts on that or uh, if that's been researched at all. It's a great question. The, the Huck Finn example is one that I love and it is, is used often in philosophy to, to explore these issues. Um, we've done a version of the experiment where people uh, sometimes shock somebody else in exchange for uh, money for themselves and other times shock somebody in exchange for money for charity. And uh, we see very different patterns of behavior in those two cases. Uh, in, in the case of uh, shocking somebody else to profit yourself, we see this characteristic pattern of a devaluation of the, of the money. Um, that does not occur when you shock somebody for charity, um, which is fascinating in the, in the context of, of broader questions about how people justify immediately harmful behaviors uh, for the sake of the greater good. And then, of course, uh, many times that, that greater good is, is, is very misguided, and many of the worst atrocities in history have been done uh, in the name of the greater good. I think uh, people are very good at, at uh, at telling stories to justify a, a particular uh, goal. Uh, and that, so this is something we're actively looking at in my lab. Other questions? Raise your hand. Can you stand up and take the mic right behind you? Yeah, I wonder if you were going to try and raise a child uh, to have strong self-control, 
what might you do, especially in the early years, before you could carry on a meaningful conversation, say zero to eight, are the things you, you can do to bolster that? <laughs> Um, Do any of you study that age range? And well, <laughs> informally. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll, I'll add one thing. So there's a recent study actually that it's kind of related to what Dylan was saying before where they actually asked young children to choose between healthy and unhealthy foods. And they did this, one, just asking them what they wanted to eat and then a second time, they gave them instructions to think about what their mom would want them to eat. Mm. And this really changed the way that they chose. They chose much healthier foods when they were supposed to consider what their mom would have them do. And so extrapolating from that, I think it would be important to have young children make decisions for themselves, but give them feedback on why did you do this and do you think this might be a better option when you see that what they're doing is, is probably not optimal for them in the, the short or the long run. So I think you need to give them practice essentially and feedback as to whether they're doing it well or how could they change. I don't know if That's the others have great. any thoughts? I don't have any, you know, I don't actually have a good answer to your question but I just want to point out that I, I'm going through this now, I have a two-year-old or almost two-year-old well, so I guess I don't know how much training I have to do at this exact moment, but uh, I, I actually think it's it's hard it's a, it's a hard self regulation problem for the parents. I mean, <laughs> you know, everything you read says you know you need to set strict rules and boundaries, and you need to like you know let them cry occasionally and not always give in to their every demand. And you know, when you love your child, it's very easy to just give in every demand. <laughs> it's total self regulation failure for me constantly, and I'm sure it's you know in the long term it would be to the detriment of our child. So we try not to do it. But, um, but yeah, it's tricky, I don't know. And there's so many, there's so many strategies for, for good parenting and, and teaching temperance and teaching you know, self-regulation success out there. And uh, I don't know if I, if I have a good answer. I, my, my answer, not as a scientist, but just as a regular person, would be probably the middle ground. If you go too far in one way, you're gonna be authoritarian and you're gonna create a kid that can't you know, think for themselves. If you go too far the other way, then you're gonna have a kid who you know, can't engage in self-control and can't, you know, uh, take care of themselves later down the road. So until science helps adjudicate what the absolutely most optimal strategy for, for teaching self-regulation is for every individual difference in the, every child, then uh, I have to think that, you know, the, the mainstream is probably the safest. Uh, I'm pretty sure I'm the only grandparent on this panel, so I've gone through two generations of this. Your own self-regulation, I think, is key in the environment you create with your kids and you get to the stress factors and others uh, you know when I and my wife were in good self-regulated modes our kids th had much better thriving than when we faced our own self-regulation issues but that's me what do I know other questions <laughs> You're saying you set, a good example. set a good example and by doing your uh, children watch and listen and learn and if they see how you self-regulate they may not be able to articulate it I think they pick it up but what do I know just two generations of kids that are not in jail and out of the house, so that's pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> Over here. Oh, I'm back there and then we'll go up here. Hi. Um, my question is for Ms. Crockett. So in your study, you tried to make... I, I was curious about what your definition of private was because you it, it was in a private thing, but people knew that other people were watching them, and there was a stranger there that they were possibly acting on and then also the reward is a social reward because there is a social uh, facet of money. So I was, I was curious as to, could you define that a little bit better? Great question. So um, we took several steps to make sure that our subjects in those experiments felt like they were making private and confidential decisions. Um, the first thing we do is we make sure that um, they don't actually interact face to face with the, the recipient of the shocks. Um, they're both present in the lab at the same time and it's very obvious that there are two people in the lab but they don't see one another's face. That's very important of course because uh, we want to preserve the, the reputation of our, of, our, of our participants and make sure that they don't run into each other in a bar later, that could go wrong. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the second thing we do is we make sure our participants know that 
no identifying information, not their name or contact details will be connected with the choices they make in the experiment. So everyone who participates gets a, an ID number that's just a sort of alphanumeric string. Um, we use that to, to keep track of, of the data that's generated in the experiments. Um, and, and we make that very clear and transparent to our, to our participants. Um, and finally, when they make their decisions, they're sitting in a room by themselves. Uh, the experimenter is not present. Um, when, when they're doing the study in the brain scanner, they're, they're in the brain scanner and, and uh, the experimenters are in the other room operating the scanner. Um, we ask everyone afterwards, did you feel observed while you were making these choices? Um, rate how observed you, you felt on a scale of one to seven, and on average, it's about a two or a three. So you know, it's not zero, but it's 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 fairly unobserved. Um, so for these reasons, we 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 think that those experiments um, can reveal how people make decisions privately. Stand up, please. Yeah, I just wanted to find out. Uh, I like the idea of this self-control because I've experienced it myself. When I want to lose weight or I want to improve my arthritic knee, I just try not to eat sugar or you know, dairy. Now, the main question I have right now is, is there a possible connection, for instance, between self-control, reward, and addiction? I mean, right now, <laughs> it's a very controversial um, issue, but... It's, uh, yes, I mean, absolutely, there is. Um, it, it's a, I, I think it's a complicated one, and, and I'm sure I'm being looked at, because um, maybe I've, I've done some smoking research. Um, uh, I, I will say, you know, there, there are people who are experts in this, and things, things are a little bit different in addiction, at least when it comes to the neuroscience of addiction. So um, uh, there, there's both the possibility that, that addicted people are... Um, at the, and on the one hand, maybe hyper responsive to, you know, reward cues, and on the other hand, they when they actually get the reward, they don't experience it as strongly, and that sort of motivates them to get more and more and more. And so there are some sort of unique aspects, I think, of of an addicted brain that are are maybe different than the populations we tend to look at. Although I, you could argue everyone who eats food is addicted to food, um, but. Um, so that makes it complicated, and it, it makes me slightly concerned that I'm not really an authority to to speak on that, um, but. Uh, I do, there is of course a huge relationship to all the systems we're talking about, uh, the people who actually, you know, study addiction and, and study, uh, you know, recovery from addiction, they look at too. And I can tell you there are, there are some studies that are closer to home, I think, for all of us that have shown that, for instance, um, success, uh, you know, success in uh, uh, quitting smoking is predicted by your ability to engage that self-control region over time and, and you can actually map this out and the people who are more successful sm uh, Smokers tend to be better able to, to use that region uh, uh, when they're engaged in different kinds of, of, of tasks where they see kind of smoking material, right? Uh, um, and then some of, the, some of the studies we have also sort of predict BMI, which isn't really predicting dieting success because we don't know if they dieted. It just sort of shows that, um, you know, over time that, that some people, you know, uh, have lower BMI than higher and that seems to be there's an association with their ability to kind of tamp down these reward cues and uh, there's many other, there's a lot more research like that. So, yeah, it's kind of my best answer. So there's a huge relationship to it, but um, uh, it can be a little bit complicated because, uh, you, yeah, because when you can become desensitized to the drug that uh, you're addicted to in a way that I don't think usually happens as much with our, the kinds of uh, stimuli we play with, the kinds of experiments we run. So last question, round robin. Um, uh, Thoreau and Emerson, when they would get together, they would always ask the same question and they would go months not seeing each other they would ask, what has become clearer or muddier since last we met? And <laughs> so in terms of this conversation, has anything become clearer or muddier about your research, this field, this question of self-control? What do you walk away from this conversation with it, with either greater clarity or a really good uh, doubt and muddiness to it? Todd? Uh, I should spend less time on my phone. That's, that's <laughs> um, no, I, I think it's clear to me that there are a lot of different approaches and ways to look at both self-control success and failure, and that we, we need this multifaceted approach, multi-pronged approach to understand this problem. Molly? 
I agree. Um, I, I have come away with lots of ideas uh, for my own research, and uh, I've, I've, I actually really like this idea of pretending to be someone else for moral decisions as well. Uh, this job. <laughs> <laughs> um, so what, how our subjects would behave if, if we asked them to pretend they were uh, Gandhi or Martin Luther King or someone very morally exemplary. Um. I think I'm left with the idea that it's very important to actually try and have a better sense of, of why, uh, you know, what is a successful self-regulation act. Um, I mean, it's something I've always been vaguely concerned about, that there's maybe a sense that what we define self-regulation success as a moralistic element to it, almost puritanical element. It is, you know, you manage to not eat the food, but sometimes it's fun to have fun. Sometimes, you know, go have a few drinks if you're socializing with your fam family, yeah, yeah well, whatever, weird family parties, but, um, uh, 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 you know, so in certain cases, uh, you know, not always engaging in self-control is actually the strategy to have a more optimum time if you're socializing or, or whatever. And, uh, you know, there's at least in my own research, there's a sense that we're not paying attention to that at all. Um, we're really just sort of focusing on this very narrow uh, uh, a view of what is a success or failure. To my defense of my own criticism of myself, uh, there is, I do tend to study the populations of dieters where it's a lot easier to, for them to say that was a self-regulation failure because I'm a dieter. If, it, if I was studying non-dieters, I would have a harder time, you know, operationalizing that. So, but it is something I, I think bears a hell of a lot more thinking about, at least in my case. Well, that makes me think of the whole multicultural dynamics of self-control. Um, and regulation. Different cultures have different value systems and different cultural dynamics on that. So that maybe another session. Maybe we'll come back a year from now and do that. Before we give it back to Ian to close us up, let's give it up for this fine panel. Well, that concludes our event for this evening. And uh, thank you all for coming out and braving the rain. And I hope you enjoyed this event. <laughs>